Hoffman, and I am the president of Advent Fellowship, which is a religious and welfare organization at UBK Hill. And we are pleased to be hosting our Sabbath school program here at Breath of Life. So of course, before we begin, we'd like to invite God's presence with a word of prayer. So please, let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up to see us another day. We thank you for bringing each and every one of us out here whereby we can come together and fellowship in your house of worship, your house of praise. We pray that as we go through this program that you will bless us and help us to be moved by your spirit. Help us that as we begin our song service that we could sing lustily and beautifully to worship your holy name. This is my prayer in your most holy name of thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. So our first hymn as we begin our song service is hymn number 388. Hymn number 388, Don't Forget the Sabbath. Hymn number 422, Marching to Zion. And let's sing like we're bringing down the army of God.
right, males, let's hear y'all sing out in this verse. Powerful voices. That's it, or walk the golden streets. Beautiful, everyone together, we're marching. to Zion. Our next hymn will be hymn number 528, hymn number 528, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Shout 
God is indeed a shelter in the time of storm. And he always shows us his marvelous grace, which is our next hymn. Hymn number 109, Marvelous Grace. of God's marvelous grace that we are Christians have this cheering hope. Our next hymn is hymn number 440, hymn number 440, how cheering is the Christian's hope. this. 
And with this, we'll sing our opening hymn, hymn number 608, Faith is the Victory. Hymn number 608, Faith is the Victory. Good morning once again, and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. It really is great to stand here in the Church of God and see so many of us come out to worship this morning. So as I would have mentioned before, I am Siobhan Blackman, and I am the president of Advent Fellowship, which is a welfare and religious association at UB Cape Hill. Throughout our year, well, throughout our time as Advent, we have been focused on aiding our fellow students with a goal of seeking knowledge, affirming faith, and changing the world. Our team this year was Strong Finish, Strong Faith, and we are beyond pleased to bring that to you here at Breath of Life for our Sabbath School program. Our program this morning is entitled, Man, You Got This. When you ask any Seventh-day Adventist, what is faith? The first thing that comes to mind is, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
But there was once a time when I was on a church program and someone said something that stuck with me. Faith is acting like it is so, even when it doesn't seem so, because God said it is so. Many a times we are placed in a situation where things may seem bleak. It may seem as though there is no hope and there is no way out. This applies to all aspects of our lives, physical, mental, emotional, and even spiritual. But this is often due to the fact that we lose sight of God, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We rely on our own strengths without placing our burdens in God, trusting that he will bring us through. Hopefully, with this program, we can learn and remember that we can give God our hearts and our all and allow him to lead the way. We must remember that man, God, has got this. So I officially welcome you to our Sabbath school program this morning. We will now have our scripture reading. The scripture reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. May the Lord add his richest blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. So we are now at a point in the program, which is our favorite part of Advil. In the Bible, we are provided with many examples of persons who let go and let go. Even in situations where it seemed as though faith was lost and there was nothing left to do, God pulled them through. Noah preached for many years without anyone heeding his call. But yet still, he kept the faith. He kept going. Mary was an unmarried woman who was with child, and she could have been faced with a lot of criticism. However, she knew that she was carrying the Savior of the world. There are many other examples, such as Moses, who led the Israelites through, not thinking that he would be good enough, and Esther, who was brave enough to stand up to the king for her people. Sometimes we may be faced with situations where we are afraid of the criticism of others. We may think, oh no, I should do this job on the Sabbath. Or we may think, what would people think of us? How would I look? But this is not the important part because God has a plan for each and every one of us. And we may have all gone through a situation, whether it be this week or any point in time in our life, where we would have had to let go and keep faith in God. So this is our testimony program, testimony segment, where we'd allow any one of you who has a testimony to share, to share your testimony with the church about how God has come through for you. Oh, don't all rush. <laughs> I'll get the ball rolling. So there was this exam that I did recently. And after the exam, I ran to the bathroom and I cried. I called my mommy and I couldn't even speak to her. She wasn't understanding anything I was saying. I was sobbing, I was crying. And I felt as though that was the worst exam I ever did in my life. I was like, there is absolutely no way I am passing this exam. And I bounced up one of my friends. She saw me when I was looking to leave. And she was like, what happened? I said, well, I uh, just had an exam that I am feeling too good about. And she asked me one simple question. She was like, Siobhan, who is your God? I say, oh, God. She's like, no, who is your God? I said, God. And she's like, so then what are you worried about? Why are you, why are you getting on as if you're not serving a God who is able to pull you through anything? And that really did give me some comfort because sometimes, like I said, we think that things are falling apart. We think we can't see our way, but we need to remember that we are serving a wonderful and mighty God. Now, I'm not going to lie and say I passed the exam. I didn't have the results yet. But <laughs> I am claiming 
that even though I may have felt as that exam was bad, that I am still serving a mighty God, who I am sure put things in that paper that I don't even remember putting for myself. Okay, so, yes, as the ball is rolling, who's up next? Yes. Good morning. Amen. We don't know how long we have. So when the Holy Spirit is calling you and telling you to fix something, don't tell him to fix it just now. Amen. Fix it now. Amen. Because you don't know how long you have. Amen. That's the thing. Sometimes we ignore God's call. We ignore his healing. But you know, we need to listen to God's word. Amen. Thank you for that testimony. Is there anyone else? Yes? Good morning, all. We are just uh, talking about faith is the victory. Indeed, faith is the victory. Um, today, my 85-year-old sister-in-law is with us because we have faith in God that no matter with the COVID, with the obstacles, she has been positive. And we have we all trust in God, and there's been uh, lots of was setbacks, but still she always kept that positive uh, attitude. And that is faith that she has in God and that I have in Everard. And we just want to praise God that we wait, had to wait long for a visa, and uh, with all the in vaccines that had to be taken, but she came through wonderfully. And we're so ha happy to have her blessing us with her gifts of arranging flowers that we can send out Sabbath greetings with the flower arrangements that she does. And she cooks very well and is helping me with the cooking. So Amen. I just praise God that she's here today. Amen. We always praise God for good food. Amen. Anyone else? We know that God has done... Yes, sister, in the back there, I see. Sister, in the back there. Good morning, all. This Good morning. This morning, I have to say that last year, I started to read and listen to my Bible from, from Genesis right down. And it kept impressing on my, the word kept impressing on my heart to worship on the Sabbath. And one day, I was at home and I heard two words, Sabbath worshiper. I, last year, sent in a letter to the former church that I used to go to for a lot of years. And from the time I came here, I remember coming to one of my step, one of my stepbrother's mother's funeral. And I told my sisters and them, this is the church I'm going to be going to from now on. And they started like, like laughed and said to me, okay, that's all right, you know, like making fun of it. But now I have found, I, the first time I came here, I felt like, okay, you are at home. This is where you are supposed to be. And I'm thanking God because hours to yesterday, I went to the supermarket and I met one of my former church members. And she said to me, have you gone back out to church? I said, I, don't, I do not worship on Sundays anymore. I'm a Sabbath worshiper. 
and she said to me, she said to me, but uh, but um, I got my friends. I said I'm not dealing with my friends. I have friends too, but I have to know where God is leading me, and Amen. I have to go where God is leading me. Amen. And from then, even before I came to church, I remember the first Sabbath that I stood home and I did nothing but sleep. I worship and I praise and I felt so at ease and so comfortable that I am thanking God that he has spared my life to see this time in my life that he has done so much for me and now he has brought me to somewhere where I am feeling like this is where I belong and I thank God for it in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Does anyone else have a testimony that they'd like to share? Going once, going twice, going a third time. Yes, please. There's always something that we can give God thanks for. Amen. Amen. Young people. Amen. I, I used to be young years ago. Just the other day. <laughs> yeah, just the other day. My several brother nurse and people like that, we used to be young. Mm -hmm. But we're no longer as young as that. It's always a blessing for us to see young people taking charge. Amen. So thank the Lord for sending you this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for having us here this morning. So as he would have said, there's always something for us to give thanks for. No matter how small it may seem, no matter how insignificant it may be to us. We are all here this morning. That is a testimony in itself. We have made it through this week. We have made it through this pandemic. And we should thank God every step of the way just for giving us life, for giving us health, and for giving us strength. So that will conclude our testimony segment for this morning. Thank you for participating. And we now have a nice, fun, interesting activity for you all. I'd like to ask all the children to please go downstairs for your own Sabbath school program. Okay. Hebrews 12 verse 1 equates the Christian life to a race. We are told to lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We are running this race to win the crown of life, while our onlookers, who may be our colleagues, family members, neighbors, friends, observe how we navigate along this track filled with obstacles placed by our rival, the devil. If we listen to the wisdom and encouragement provided by our coach, Jesus Christ, we'll be able to succeed. Now we'll watch a video about a man named Cliff Young. Friends, we all know a marathon is one of the longest and hardest races a person can run. But did you hear about the ultra marathon they used to have in Australia? It was 544 miles from Melbourne to Sydney. It attracted as many as 150 world-class athletes. But then something happened that no one would ever forget. In 1983, a 61-year-old potato farmer named Cliff Young decided to enter the race. Uh, people were very amused because he had on rubber galoshes over his boots. And when the race began and all the runners took off, sure enough, old Cliff was left behind, shuffling along very slowly, but he was shuffling very persistently. Normally, during this seven-day race, the runners would go about 18 hours running and then they'd sleep for six hours. But nobody ever told Cliff that. When the other runners stopped to rest during the night, Cliff just kept on running. Some people were afraid Old Cliff was going to have a heart attack, and they were asking the race organizers to show mercy and stop the crazy old man, but he would have none of it. Each day, he was gaining on the pack, because when they were sleeping, he was plodding along. 
During the last night of the race, Cliff passed all of these world-class athletes. Not only was Cliff able to run that 544-mile race without dying, he won, beating all the other racers by nine hours, breaking the record and becoming a national hero in the process. What's really amazing is when they told him that he had won the $10,000 prize, he looked confused and said he didn't know there was a prize, and he decided to share it with the other runners. When asked how he was able to run all night long, Cliff responded that he grew up on a farm where they had about 2,000 head of cattle, and because they couldn't afford horses, he used to have to round them up on foot, sometimes running two and three days nonstop. So, throughout the race, he just imagined he was chasing after the cows and trying to outrun a storm. Old Cliff's secret was to keep on running while others were sleeping. You know, the Bible tells us that the race is not necessarily to the swift. Something like Aesop's parable of the tortoise and the hare, the tortoise just kept on plodding along. That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 13, he that endures unto the end, the same will be saved. Now you might slip and fall during the race. You might even get off to a bad start. But in the Christian race that we run, the main thing is you want to finish well. Keep on running, friends, and don't give up. Friends, if you enjoyed what you've just seen, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to the Amazing Facts channel. So what can we learn from this video about Cliff Young? Well, we can learn that the race isn't for the swift, but for those who persevere. While the others were sleeping, Cliff ran without stopping. This enabled the 61-year-old man to gain several mi miles ahead of the professionally trained runners. We can also learn that we should not compare our walk with Christ to our fellow Christians. Cliff, when he entered the race, he could have looked at his fellow competitors and said, well, I'm not trained, I should not be here. But instead, he focused and he was able to win. So keep your focus on Jesus. Cliff used to run for three days to round up the cattle because his family couldn't afford the horses to aid in the roundup. God was able to use the skills that Cliff gained during his less desirable situations to win the race. Similarly, God can use our trials for our own benefit. Now let's be realistic for a second. Me telling you to trust God during your trials is easier said than done. So here are some things that you can do to get yourself in the right direction. First of all, cast aside all the weights. Forget about the distractions. If you spend five hours on Instagram and Facebook, cut it down and spend some time with God. We should also surround ourselves with fellow worshipers who can help guide us and encourage us. Romans 15 verses 5 and 6 says, now may the God of patience and comforts grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may be with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Jesus Christ. We can also observe the lives of the pioneers. For example, Job. We can revise God's promises to gain the strength and to persevere. Promises like, James chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that loved him. We can sing songs to lift our spirits. We can take an example from David when he played the harp and sang to Saul when he was depressed. Music is a very powerful tool. We can speak to God. Even when you don't feel like talking to him, tell him that, tell him, God, I don't really feel like speaking right now. I'm depressed, this, that, and that. He'll understand. At least we're not icing him out. We may be bruised and battered, but we'll still be at peace at the end of our trials. At the end, we should be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7.
Amen. Sometimes we may think we need to run quick to finish, but sometimes we just need to take our time and endure the party for us. So at this point, we will collect our offering. However, as you know, as he said, thanks for the young people being here. We have two offerings to collect this morning. This offering will be for Sabbath school, and there'll be an offering later on for Advent Fellowship, which we appreciate daily. So at this point, we also love to sing an Advent. We'll sing hymn number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, as we collect our offering. For Sabbath school. Merciful Father, we thank you for giving us the strength whereby we could go out and work so that we could bring back an offering for you. The Lord, I pray that you would be with what we have, be with what we collected this morning, and I pray that you help us so that I could bless others and reach the furtherance of your gospel. Continue to bless us as we go out and work for you, dear Heavenly Father. This is my prayer in the most holy name of thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. So at this point in time, we all know we're ready for lesson study, right? Amen. We study our lesson this week. Amen. 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 All right. So we have Mr. Jamal Thomas, who is here with us this morning, a vibrant young man ready to help us study God's word. So at this point in time, I introduce him as we have our lesson study. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Breath of Life, I haven't been here for a little while, so for those of you who may not remember, I don't see any of the younger people who I might remember, but I, I see some of the a little, a little more mature younger people who I remember, who I see. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you always for um, the, intro, the introduction to share God's word with you. I'm not preaching today, but today we're doing the lesson study. Now, um, I was told that there's a mic available somewhere that we can receive feedback from the sitting Sabbath school class. That's all right? Excellent. All right, so 
Okay, here we go. Now, I, I understand this week that we are looking at something that is very familiar to us as Seventh-day Adventists, right? So what I will do, I, I did prepare to go through it step by step, but because I know it's a familiar topic, I, I'm welcoming, feel free to ask all, any and all questions that are related to the lesson study. Is that okay? All right, good, very good. So let's go, enough waffling. So this week, uh, the lesson study, the adult lesson study is entitled uh, The Fall, right? Um, and this week, at the very least, we can all say the memory, memory text together is taken from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right? You don't have to stand and say it, but I ask you to read it for me. It should be on the screen here. I have it here on the next slide. It says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, anybody has any comments about what they see here? Anything that stood out to you this week uh, or anything like that, right? Um, I will invite you, if you do have any comments, I don't know what the process here is. I imagine you would indicate by standing and or raising your hand and the deacon perhaps will come to you. Is that how it works here? I don't know, I'm a visitor, you tell me. You're gonna set up a mic, somebody will come to it. What happens? The roving mic, excellent, thank you, good. So, um, while you're thinking about the comments that you want to make, let me just go ahead and make, to give you my introductory comments. Now, there are two things that I observe during the week that the, the author of the lesson attempted to do. Hello. <laughs> All right, there are two things. And I try to, to condense them here into two short paragraphs, which is on the next slide, and I will read them for you. Here it goes. It says, Adam and Eve were warned against eating from the tree of knowledge of good, of the knowledge of good and evil. Though they were to know good, they were not to know evil. However, Amid this tragedy comes hope in Genesis 3.15, which is that God has made a way of escape for us all. Now, I stop here. I stop here because I am aware, again, uh, this is a very, very, we go through it a lot. Um, but I stop here to ask a question, really. Um, so, I am aware that very often when we broach this topic, a question always comes up. What are you talking about? What is the question? Where did evil come from? That, that never, never comes, you've never spoken to somebody uh, or at least read the account from Genesis and then people ask this amazingly deep question, where did evil come from? That, has that ever happened to any of you? Yeah, yeah man, it happens to me a lot. I work with a, a young person, a young man, he's not, he doesn't consider himself to be religious, but he, he, he challenges me a lot on this question. So I decided, after reading the, the white comments for the day, to include a short uh, excerpt from one of the great controversy, one of the lines here from the great controversy that I thought would be instructive or helpful to solve this question from the get-go. Is it okay if we read the, uh, from the, yes, it's all right? So I have it on the screen. I know the text is really small. I, that's all right. I'm gonna put it here, I have it here. I'm gonna read it for you. It's taken from the great con page 492, and it's helping to answer a question here. It begins, it is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet, enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught in Scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin. Now, I'm going to stop here. I expect there to be at least a comment from the Sabbath school class. So, Sabbath school, is God responsible for sin? How do you know that? You can answer either from what the Bible has said or the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, I see a hand here. Um, the deacons are coming to you. Yes. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Hello. Sin is actually, could actually be contextualized as the seed of disobedience. And God 
if you look at the first few chapters in Genesis, God being consistent with his character is a protector of all his children. So that was his plan initially to be protective, he's omniscient, and he knew what was to come. And it's only because of disobedience that's what breeds sin. Mm -hmm. So all the evil is a consequence of sin being introduced and compromising God's initial plan. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another hand over here. And while we are going there, I don't want us to get stuck here. I know for some reason sin is a pet topic of most Adventist churches I go to. I don't know why. But we're going to talk a little bit about salvation and hope, which is the other major thing that the author wanted to accomplish today. All right. We only have a short time, so I'm going to take one more comment here, and then we're going to take a step forward. Yes, please. When God finished creation, he said everything was very good. Say that again. Full stop. Say that again. When God finished creation, he said everything is very good, perfect for the purpose for which it was created. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Yes. And so what the, thank you very much. And what she is saying here is that when God was finished, everything was complete, everything was perfect. It was never intended that sin should, sin is an intruder, like, a, like you're in your home, everything is fine, and somebody breaks in and, you know, confuses the place. Sin is like that, as it were, in that scenario. It is an intruder. It was never intended, but God planned that in the event that it should happen, there was a plan. We're going to hear a little bit more about that. So I'm going to go forward to the next slide here. Um, but one thing I want, if you didn't hear anything else, in case anybody ever challenges you about that, from the word of God, you can say, based on this, the comments from what the sister here in the black had said, God made everything perfect. Full stop. But there is a reason for it. Not so as we can explain the origin of it, but there is enough is revealed that we can understand something about the anatomy of the situation that we should be able to give at least a just answer, not to point the finger at God, but to say it is an intruder, and that intruder here has something to do with this serpent. Now, what do we understand here? Whoa, 10 more minutes, let's go. Satan is a literal being and not a metaphor. What does Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 say? Uh, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Oh, right, I actually have it there. Right. Was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat up from any tree of the garden? And I ask some questions here. Now, according to what we know, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9, I put it there for you so you can think about what's written there. Now, some, some person who was, already knows about the topic, tell us, who is the serpent? Satan. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, he's the serpent here in the garden too? All right, good. So, and tell me, according to what you know, it is written in Gen Genesis chapter 3, how does he go about deceiving Eve? Well, we have it here. Indeed, has God said? Yes, he, he's asking, did you say questions? Yes, he's asking questions. He's asking questions. He's asking questions that do something. And when I was looking at it this week, I saw that he asked questions that seemed to imply that he was agreeing with what God said. Didn't God say that? But that wasn't actually the case, was it? In fact, by the time Eve understood what his real purpose was, she was already so wrapped up in the conversation that when he came out and said, look, that's not going to happen to you. You're not going to die. She, she was already... So what can we learn here about sin here, about the devil here? One quick point, what can we learn about this before we go forward again? It, who he is, but he presents a little truth mixed with error and he learns and deceives and leads the way i like that so okay good i can close that idea right there and go forward two things i wanted to take away from here it's on the next slide it says satan is a literal being do you know in 2022 there are still i want to say let me let me frame it in the context of the church there's still some people who not just among us but among some of our our brethren who are called christians who still do not believe that satan is a literal being did you, did you know that? 
yeah, there's some people who still do not believe that he is a, they believe that he is some sort of a way to explain evil and not a literal adversary of Christ, right? So I put that there. I thought that was important. And the strategy of asking questions, the sister beautifully framed it, so I'm not going to go there again. Uh, the next slide, well, two slides from there. Whoever is working the slides, just go forward two slides, please. So we're at the section under the forbidden fruit. I put a text here. I'm going to read it for you. Uh, if you're following in your Bibles, I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. This is what it says. It says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but, read this part for me. It says what? But from the tree of what? Knowledge of? You shall not. For in the day that you eat, what's going to happen? Whose words were those? They were God's words. So here it is. God defined something here. What did God define? He defined what was, what was expected, what was good for them. Eat, rather, I, I would say, you have to go back a little bit. He told them, if this, was, if this were the garden, he said, all these trees, eat. But he said, look, watch it. One in the center, do not eat. Because when you eat, you will surely, that's what he said. So in my mind, he defined what was good, and then he defined what was. Now, there is a difference between what God said and what the Satan said. The question here then becomes, Satan attacked the Eve, and by extension the holy couple, on two fronts. He challenged what death was, and he challenged their knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, or their understanding thereof. Right? Yes, I see. I see. I have my timer going. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, good. So, what I took away from this is that, and the lesson said it in, in the coming out here, go forward one slide, please, uh, is that, actually, go forward two. Thank you. Is that I understood that this, the there are some things that have taken root in the mind of everybody in this world, sometimes without their personal knowledge. And what, what are you talking about? Just say it plainly. That many people still believe that there are some parts of a human being that are immortal. This is why when we go to some funerals, and I, and I, I speak... Um, I'm trying to say it clearly, but also be, be kind to people. But some people in their heart still want to believe that when people die, their loved ones and their relatives, friends, and so on, that they go to heaven or that their, their spirits will come and speak to my brother there and just let him know, I'm okay, I'm not in pain, I'm not suffering, and so on and so on, right? So what we are saying here, what we are saying here, this has its roots in what was written here, right? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, right? And I, I need to say this very clearly, that this is still a lie. You heard? It's not true. God says, be, because of, of the sin that was committed, mankind has, you will die. And when you're dead, according to what's written in, in the Holy Book, there is no more knowledge, no more remembrance. You have no more involvement in what, what happens here. The dead do not praise God. None of that. That's clear, is it? Yeah. So what we have to do, we have to do when we are still alive. So I encourage you to praise God today when you have the chance, yes? All right, good. So the next idea here I want to give to you. Now, I don't want to rush it, right? Considering that there are, according to my timer here, just, I, I don't know what that means. Could somebody come and say it to me in plain, got it, right. They're, they're going to tell me when to cut. Definitively, right? Okay, good. Um, so, let me open up to you guys here. I could keep going as I had planned, but I want to ask you, were there any burning questions or any ideas that you thought were big and beautiful that you wanted to bring to the Sabbath school class this morning? Yes. Just raise your hand, let the deacon go to you. So while they're coming to you, I don't see you, but while they, I see a hand here. So while they're coming to you, let me just introduce this next idea here now. It says, hiding before God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says, says this, right? The, the verses say this. Then the Lord God called to the man 
and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Question I want to ask is, why did God ask those questions? That's what they asked in the quarterly. That's what I'm asking the class. But I know that there was something the brother here wanted to share. So I'm going to invite you to make your comment now. Yes, please. Go ahead. No, just a couple of things. I know time, time is gone. Yeah, just three but, minutes. But, don't but worry. Eve had to face the fact that here, as far as she knew, only her and Adam could talk mm -hmm. on earth. And here is the serpent talking. Never, never seen that before. And not only is the serpent talking, but the serpent is eating the fruit. Mm -hmm. and so the deception was great for her. Yeah. Yes? And for us, we, we suffered. We have great deception that we are told we will face in these last days as well. Mm -hmm. So we need to know for sure what God says. Yes. That's one. And then two, sin. Um, God had to die because of sin. Mm -hmm. Had to die because of sin. That's, that's two. Yeah. And the third one was that um, Jesus exposed, even although Satan hides, Jesus exposed evil angels. Once he was here, he cast them out left, right, and center. Uh, evil angels are real. Yes. And uh, what they do is real. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Jesus showed them up all through his time here. He showed them up. And we have, them, we have challenges with them in the last days. And we will have even more challenges with them in the last days because they know their time is short. All right. Thank you for your comments. There's one, one comment here. I see that I have, what is it? The timer says two minutes. Literally two minutes, not pretend Sabbath school two minutes. So we're coming here. I'm going to make this comment. I see there's a, another comment there. Go ahead. Since you're here already, you, go ahead, go ahead, make it quick. And um, then we'll, oh, wait, wait, brother. Oh, sorry. There, I thought there was another mic. My apologies. You're here. We'll take the comment here. And then you'll go to the door. Those are the last two. And then we're going to bring this into a close. I want to be invited back another time, so don't, don't find me. <laughs> I, I am not sure if the serpent was eating the fruit or not, because it does not say that. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is that the conversation that he was having with Eve caused her to doubt what God said. Yes. That's, and that that's, is what yeah. was the problem. Yeah. She doubted what God yes. said. So our defense against the enemy is to use the stick to the word mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is important. Now, let me say like now, the, um, the difference that you're seeing here is between what is written in the word of God and what is in the spirit of prophecy, right? It's okay. You just need to be able to make a difference between the two, and that's fine. But you're right. It, it would seem as the, the, the hand was at near the back there. At the, the hand was near the back on the right side, on your right. Uh, but yes, right? That's important. And, and I don't have a difficulty with that. And I like how you ended. And I actually have that on my slide as the last thing I wanted to give you. So since you said it, I'm going to repeat it. It says just in brief, in the final analysis, men will not be destroyed because they believed a lie. They will be destroyed because they did not believe the truth which God spoke. Church, if you don't hear anything else, you have to take this. In the end, it's not about Eve eating the fruit and Adam wasn't there and they were separate, all of that. No. People can be deceived or they can make conscious choices, but the both of them end up being the same in that we are not believing to act on what God has said. And this is the reason why people will be destroyed. So at, we want to give the hope. The hope is wrapped up in the seed and so on. Oh, lost. They've come for me. 13 seconds. So take this comment and I'm done. Okay, um, I want to say this. Um, Eve opened the door mm. because she wasn't sure about what God said because she added in touch. God didn't say anything about touching. And from the time she added in that, that gave sin the opportunity to do, to fulfill what he wanted to fulfill. So we have to be careful in what we say pertaining to God's word before we check for ourselves to know the truth. Thank you very much. Okay, Sabbath school class, I'm going to end here. I, I know there are some other things that you wish to say. What I would encourage you to do, as any good Sabbath school teacher here would do, is to please make time to study the Word of God. Um, let's, let's put away our 
preconceived ideas and just read what it says, asking God to open our minds so that he can show us what the truth really is and to improve our lives. Uh, with this, I will invite you really to study for next week's lesson study, and I'm sure that God will bless you. And let me leave you with this last word. The hope that we are looking towards is that promised seed. And the promised seed which was promised in Genesis 3.15 is Jesus. It is my hope and prayer that you will invite him one more time to come into your hearts. And if you haven't already done that, today is a good day to do so. So God bless you as we continue the program. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank the brother for that riveting Bible study, lesson study just now. And I'm just here to pull everything together as we prepare to go into our next segment of our, of our program. So lesson two, we're looking at the fall, right? Right? Okay, great. <laughs> so you now Sunday, you would have the serpent. Monday, as you go through the week, you'll get to all that stuff. Now what I want to do is paint a very simple picture. Um, we spoke about Eve and the fruit. Now one simple question. For all of us, we all have that one fruit. That one fruit in our lives. I'm not asking for us to jump and wave and tell us what that fruit is, but you guys get the point. There's always that one thing that catches our eye that shouldn't catch our eye, right? Or that one thing that we know we shouldn't do that we still do. But remember the theme for this morning. Siobhan, what's the theme again? Man, you got this, all right? So when you look at the entire story of Adam and Eve, and I guess you know, as you go through the week, you'll see more about that. But as it pertains to the fruit, there's always that one fruit in our life, and then there's always that one serpent. Now, when I say serpent, I don't want persons looking to the brother or the sister next to them, you know. I'm talking about, you know, that one thing that is in your mind that keeps telling you, you should go and do this, when you know you shouldn't do it. That's, you know, we always talk about the still small voice, right? But you know that we can have sometimes two different small voices in our heads. One that's telling us to go here and the next that's telling us to go there. So when we're talking about man, you got this, and pulling everything together from what you would have studied here, we could easily say that Eve and Adam, they didn't have it. Or I should say they did have it, but they squandered it. I know young people, we have a phrase called, um, what's the phrase? Um, fumbling the bag. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Fumbling the bag? It's a young people phrase, don't worry. It, it basically means you have something good and you let it slip away. Or you mess up and now you don't have it anymore. It's usually referring to like a relationship or something. If you find a good man or a good woman and they say you fumble the bag, it means that you, you know, you didn't make the most of that opportunity. We could easily say that Adam and Eve, they didn't make the most of what God would have given to them, right? God gave them a perfect garden, a perfect world, and they fumbled the bag. However, there's hope, and, and that was brought out in the lesson study. There's hope knowing that even though they would have fumbled the bag, even though there was that fall, there's then that rise. And we were talking about, you know, man, you got this. And as I said, many of us, we have that fruit. We may have that serpent in our minds that's telling us to, to do something we know we shouldn't do. But I'm here to tell you, you got this. And you have the hope and you have the faith in God to allow you to do that. So even though you may have that fruit that looks really good, or that serpent that's in the back of your mind telling you to do something that you know you shouldn't do, be rest assured that you can rise again even though there was this fall brought on the lesson study. So my admonishment to you as I run because we're pressed for time is to, you know, don't focus on the fruit. It may look lovely. The serpent may be in your mind all the time. But I implore you, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and these things will be added unto you. And don't forget... You got this. Thank you. Amen. So at this point, we will collect the second offering for Advel. And while we do that, we will simply sing, give, and it will come back to you.
us bow our heads for prayer. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for sparing our lives to see another Sabbath day. We thank you for the rest that you have given us, Lord. I pray that the offering that we have taken up, Lord, will be spread all over the world, Lord, to further your gospel, Lord. Help us to continue to spread your word to everyone we meet, Lord, and most importantly, to obey your word. I pray that as we continue throughout this service, Lord, that we will be attentive and that we will remember the purpose for us being here, Lord, which is to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In your name I pray, amen. So yes, we just like to say thank you to each and every one of you who participated in our program this morning, and thank you to you, the congregation here at Breath of Life, for allowing us to have our program. So what we'll do is have, well, we prayed on the offering and the closing prayer, so we just have a quick, a quick prayer once more. Dear God, thank you for everything that you have done for us. I pray that you would take this, this offering and help us so that it will be used to our welfare purposes at Adfel. Help us so that we could use this offering to reach others at UE and whichever endeavor we may do later on. Bless us, bless those here at Breath of Life and continue to bless us. In your name we pray, amen. So thank you once again. We really appreciate and are honored to be here this morning. And we pray that God continues to bless you throughout the rest of his Sabbath day. With this, Sabbath School is now adjourned. I just want to say a quick thank you to Advent Fellowship from the UE. And I want us to give them a round of applause and thank them for coming and sharing the Sabbath School program with us this morning. It was wonderful, heart lifting, and really a credit to them and credit to God. Thank you, Advent Fellowship. And as I said, Sabbath School is now adjourned. Good morning, church. This is our 10 minutes feature for our stewardship department. And I just want to let you know that um, this year, the conference stewardship department is highlighting a mentorship program for our young people. For our young people, and they've asked us to choose someone who we could mentor for future leadership in this, um, this, this department of the church. And they're thinking of also doing it for other departments as well. This morning I have Sister Eden John. She has been chosen and she will do our 10 minutes feature for us this morning. So please welcome her and give her your undivided attention. Thank you. to this island um, who would have spoken with Pastor um, Haynes just a couple of days ago. Um, this visitor was in transit to Barbados um, but is unable to leave at this time. If she is here, that visitor to Barbados, I'd like to meet with her. Um, if that visitor is here with us, I think I, see, I think I see a hand down here, so I think I, I know what it is. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Good morning, church. Our 10-minute feature, okay. feature is entitled Words to the Youth. So this simply speaks of the youth, where the youth can in invest their time into godly stuff. Not saying that other stuff are not good as well, they are. But there are three topics, and I will break down each topic, and I'll give you a synopsis of what it is. So the first topic is Words to the Youth. This basically speaks about how we can deny ourselves, how we can set aside time for God. Yes, in school, in work, we will be really, really busy, and we will not always have time, but it is still saying that God should still be at the top of our list, no matter what it is, or 
whatever we have to do throughout the week. Because sometimes I am very busy and I don't always get a time to do my lesson study. But I still remember that that same lesson study helps me throughout the week. And this part um, really stood out to me, so I will read it. We sin against ourselves when we are satisfied with enough to eat and drink and wear. God has something higher than this before us. When we are willing to put away our selfish desires and give the powers of heart and mind to the work of the cause of God, heavenly agencies will cooperate with us, making us a blessing to humanity. So especially this part, even when I was in nursing school, I had a lot of problems where I didn't always get to my lesson study or sometimes I would look at the lesson study and I would just look at it and look off because I know I had a lot of schoolwork and I did not have the time. But I still remember to get through that course, I needed God at the top of my triangle. I needed God because I needed God because the work was, it wasn't hard, but nursing school is stress. But I realized that with God, I'm putting the lesson study, even if I didn't read the entire lesson study, I will read the day. And I will say, well, okay, well, I will read this day. And sometimes, yes, I will have problems if I go to my clinicals or stuff like that. But I remember that I prayed and that God is in charge of my day. So the way my day goes is organized by God. So if it happened, God allowed it to happen to either teach me a lesson or to show, him, to show me his work in whatever it is. So the next topic is deny self and improve talent. This, this really hit me hard because again, when I was in nursing school, I did not have the opportunity to go out with friends. I couldn't say, well guys, let's go. Tonight we're going to have a movie night or whatever. I couldn't because I had to study. I had to get ready for my exams. I, I couldn't. So it taught me that even if I denied myself in doing that, that it shows that, look, I could put my mind to anything. You could deny yourself. Sometimes you will walk in town and you'll see a nice dress that you want to buy you say, I want this dress. But you look at it and your money, it has enough for the Lord's tithe and offering. And when you look at the rest, the rest is for the rent and the utilities. And you're like, okay, I will not take out of God's money. And you, you have to deny yourself sometimes. So even though it may seem hard, and you may look at that money and say, Shh, but God won't mind. Yes, God will mind. Because our tithes and offerings are not ours, they're God's. So when we pull out of God's money and say, man, I can just buy this little dress, man, I ain't getting hurt or whatever. Yes, because God can give things and he can take them away. So that same money that God put in your hand, he can say, you know what, you're not using my gifts wisely. I will take them away from you. So I had to learn to deny myself of a lot of things, time with my friends, my money, and stuff like that. I had to give it to the cause of God, and I'm very grateful because it helped me. It told me, well, look, if you could do this in the smallest of things, you could overcome the biggest situations, but just know it will be with God. So a last topic is children may learn self-denial. Again, it talks about the same denying yourself from whatever it is. Sometimes you look and you see things may be really difficult, things may not be going the way you want, but you remember when you pray, or another, another example, fasting. I love my belly bad, bad. But there are some situations that have faced me throughout life where I have had to pray and fast. When I was in secondary school, I was being bullied, and I told myself, you know what, is teaching me something. So my mom always used to tell me, pray and fast is the devil using people to bully you, whatever, whatever. And I say, you know what? And when I started to pray and fast, I realized that they were not, it wasn't them, it was Satan in them. So sometimes you have to deny yourself, be it food, be it money, be it time, be it whatever, to the cause of Christ. This, is, this whole 10 minute feature speaks about us youth, as in the same youth that came today and presented the program. They devoted most of their time to their work. And we all here, Sometimes we go through things and we may look at it as God being harsh on us or God don't love us or whatever, but sometimes God is putting through that test to see if we will deny ourselves and serve him. So, church, let us remember that whatever we do, put God first in every situation, and he will take us through whatever it is. I, I would just want to thank Eden for that presentation. Um, 
here at the church, the church department, we are, are really trying to help our young people to you know, contribute to the work of God, using their talents, their time, and even their gifts, the money. You know, teach them how to, how to, to um, tithe and give offerings to support the work of God. And we must start this from when they are very young so that they can be part of the work. So may God continue to bless our young people as we enroll them and encourage them in the work that he has for us. And while I'm here, let me um, remind you that this evening we are having a program sponsored by the Pathfinder Club. It's, it is to be an, um, a pinning and induction ceremony service. So we hope that you will come back this evening and support us and give us your blessings this evening. The time is 4.15 p.m. 4.15 p.m. Thank you. We'll continue with number 36, O Thou in whose presence my soul takes delight. 36. Continue with 246, 
Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Number 27, rejoice ye pure in heart, 207. Kindly be seated. Again, we want to express our gratitude to the Advent Fellowship Group who are here with us today. It's just that you have a good, a wonderful sitting with us. It is always our pleasure to be in the presence of young people, younger people. Thank you very much. Incidentally, sister, when I heard your name, um, I began, began to reflect on the fact that many, many Barbadians migrated to Trinidad um, during the 19th century, and some of the names like Blackman and Graphic are in fact Barbadian names. So if you check your background, you'll probably find 
that your, grand, your great granddaddy or somebody there is Bajan. And I don't know if many of you know that it has been said that the name Bajan, which is used by Trinidadians, um, is really a corruption of Bajan. Some of the Bajans went there, Bajan so bad in Labantil and some places like that, that they became known as Bajans. So that, <laughs> but we're glad you're, glad you're with us. Just a few announcements uh, before we continue our service. Um, Sister Loretta Sandiford um, is leaving shortly um, for a trip overseas, and she'll be away from us, from us for about two months. We want to keep her in our prayers. I'm certain she'll be very happy to know that the church at Breath of Life um, is praying for her. We also wish to, um, to announce that there'll be a movie night tonight, at seven, I think it's at 7.15 p.m., I, I can't recall the exact time, but those who are involved will know. Um, movie night, um, uh, the adventurers are involved and other associated groups, so please bear in mind and understand that refreshments will also be, be um, provided. So for those of, again in the adventurers group and those who are associated, they will know about this particular event. We are, of course, very sad to announce the passing of Sister Vesta Alder. Um, some of you who were, the, were, were with us on Wednesday would already have heard, but there's some of you who are here today uh, will not be aware that our sister has passed. Um, we had an initial uh, date and time for the funeral, but that has changed. As far as I'm aware, her funeral is now on the 14th, the 14th of April. As far as I know, that's um, next, next Thursday. So bear that in mind, Sister Alder, and I understand that the view will be from 1, 1 p.m. on Thursday and, um, and the funeral itself will begin at, at 2, 2 p.m. So remember that, Sister Vesta Alder. Let's keep the family too in our prayers. Also, there will be a, a memorial service here at Breath of Life Church on the 22nd of April, and I want you to listen out for that. Um, the person who's, who, whose memory we are, we are we presenting to you is the son of the late brother Leonard Ford. Um, some of you will be familiar with the fact that when this church was started, brother Leonard Ford was one of the key persons whose ministry, who sacrifice, did a whole lot for this church. At one time, we were out of money. And Brother Leonard Ford made available over $40,000 of his own family's money for us to continue with the work on this church. I'm saying this to you because when that memorial service is held here, it would be a shame, an absolute shame, for the family to be here for that memorial service and Breath of Life members not turn up. So listen out, and we'll give you more information next Sabbath, God willing, but we will want you to know that your presence is needed. Don't let the family come here and then say that Breath of Life Church is bare boo. You understand what I mean when they say that? Don't let us go. You don't understand? By John, you're right. Don't don't let's say you're a bad job. We're going to say, don't let's say you're a bad job. So may God continue to bless you and bless us as we continue to, um, to worship. We already heard the next one for this evening. The pinning of their groups, uh, various groups, and we uh, again want to invite you, if it's possible, that you can attend. Also, continue to go to your computers. Uh, remember that our service, our Wednesday evening services are normally held um, virtually. So we want you to remember again um, that to listen out, look for the links, and be ready. I understand the link for today has already been sent out. So if you have friends who are listening to the program, I understand that there are probably two links, one on Zoom and the other one on YouTube. So please bear in mind, those, those, if you have relatives who are not here today, friends of the church, church members who are not here today, and you want to say, just check your church chat and you'll find the link that you can send to, uh, to those persons. God bless you.
a very special Sabbath to each and every one of you. A very pleasant Sabbath to each and every one of you. This church is beginning to look like breath of life again. You know, there's no place like church. I don't know why some people don't like to come to church. I have no idea. A very special welcome to each and every one of you. Um, it's, it's, uh, glad, I'm glad to see you here again in person. Do, those who are um, worshiping with us on the, on the online um, platforms, you're, you're welcome as well. A very special welcome to Pastor Beckers and Sister Beckers. Pastor Beckers doesn't know this, but he's, uh, he's very special to me because on the 20th of April 2002, at about 4.45 at Bath Beach. I heard, I now baptize you, in a very special voice, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy. Well, I ain't hear nothing else. I didn't hear anything. Thank you, Pastor Beckers. I'm eternally grateful. So welcome to Breath of Life, and I know you will enjoy the worship with, with us here today. Call to worship. Kindly stand. Call to worship now. The call to worship comes from Psalm 118, 24 to 26. It says, This is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be happy. Let us celebrate. May God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Verse 1 of number 25. Heavenly Father, this morning we come to your presence with hearts that are filled with gratitude. As we enter even now into this special phase of our worship, we ask you today, God, to come by here, help that whatever is said from this desk will bring honor and glory to your name, special blessings and encouragement to this building congregation, these mercies. These blessings we claim in Jesus' name and let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Kindly remain standing for the scripture reading, which is taken from Isaiah 49, and I shall read in your hearing from verse 14 to verse 16. Isaiah 49, from verse 14 to verse 16. The word of God says, and I'm, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me. My Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her second child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palm of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. May the Lord add his richest blessings to the reading of his word. Please. Amen. Kindly remain standing again for the opening hymn, which is 515. 
don't waste time, we will collect the days, five offerings and goodwill gifts, free will gifts. Him 515. <laughs> Please bow your heads for prayer, and I invite you to kneel where possible. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come into your courts with thanksgiving and praise, because Lord, we know the fact that we are here means that we already are blessed. So Lord, we thank you for delivering us through this week that we may gather together as a church family in your presence. Lord, you have promised to keep us from temptation, but Lord, you know you have never promised to keep, that you would keep us from trials, but we know that even in our trials, even in the times that we live in, Lord, that you have promised that you would never leave us or forsake us. And even in temptations, Lord, you weigh them beforehand, knowing that we do not bring a temptation to us that we cannot overcome. So Lord, knowing this, we thank you for how you have led us thus far, and relying on that, Lord, Help us to always have faith that you will deliver us in the future. Lord, as we gather in your presence, we know that those are gathered among us have several different needs, Lord. We know that many, many of us are stressed, 
Many of us are fearful. Many of us, Lord, are even in mourning because there's so much death and sickness among us. Lord, we ask for a special infilling of your Holy Spirit to comfort us this morning and encourage us as we look to the way forward. Strengthen our faith, Lord. And we know that our faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. Help us even in these times of distraction and worry to remember that the source of our strength to help us through this is in your word. So help us not in our distress and our distraction to forget to refuel, to spend time in your word every morning and evening so that we can continue to be sustained even in these times. Lord, in a special way, I want to bring those that, who are sick among us. Lord, place your healing hands on them. Touch them from the top of the head to the sole of their feet. You have created every cell. You have numbered each here. And Lord, you are our healer. And you know that if we have faith, that you can heal us. Lord, you have also given us a message, a health message, Lord, that you have freely given us to sustain our health. Help us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians to adhere to these simple values as well, to keep us from ill health. Help us to be encouraged, Lord, to maintain these, especially in these times where we know that sickness and all sorts of diseases among, abound. You have already prepared the way, Lord, for us to navigate through these times. I ask you, Lord, in a special way to bless our young people among us. Lord, we want to see them grow and to continually inspire the rest of us and to lead their church. You have called them, Lord, to lead out even in these last times, and you have empowered them with intelligence, with strength, and with vision. So, Lord, we want to, as a church, continue to value them, push them forward so that you can use them in a mighty way to lead this church into the future and into the end of time. Lord, in a special way, I want you to bless our leaders. Help us to unite together as a church, not under anything but your truth. Help us to be united. Help us to continue in fellowship and help us to be a united voice as we show the world the way to your feet. And you know that as you are lifted up, others will be drawn unto you. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us where we have erred and help us to pledge from today onward that we will walk in spirit and in truth. I ask you, Lord, to bless the remaining of the proceedings that we will have today. I ask you to bless the speaker, Pastor Beckles, in a mighty way. Help him to stand up and to speak out. Help us to be inspired to follow you and renew our spiritual encounter after we have heard what he has to say. And we ask that we not see him, but we see you shining true in every word and in every text that he will present. I also ask, Lord, that you will bless the offering that we have just given. Bless each every hand that would have given to you. Um, Lord, let the every cent that was given be multiplied threefold or even tenfold, Lord, as it goes far to do your work, to maintain your church, and to bless your gospel workers out there. And for those of us who have financial worries, Lord, we ask that you will continue to provide. Help us remember that you are the true source, not the job, not the money, and that if we have faith, you said that you would always provide. You will never see the righteous forsaken or see begging bread. So, Lord, as we continue before you, bless us. Help us to worship today in spirit and in truth. And at the end of time, Lord, help each and every one of us gather to be here, to be ready to go to heaven with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, let the church say amen. amen. I got here so quickly. <laughs> I'm waiting for something else to happen, you see. <laughs> but I, I thank God this morning for giving me the privilege to be in another worship session like this. Um, for many weeks, we have been doing the other thing. But they tell me there is no thing like this kind of fellowship. And this morning, as I look out across the family here, I notice all the spaces that are available are being used up. That's good news. It's not like that everywhere. This morning, um, we have come to worship, to give God praise and thanks for his loving kindness, his tender mercy towards us. And I thought today, because of all that's happening in our world, all that's happening in our country, all that's happening in our families, and in our personal lives, that I'll take these moments to bring to the family of God some words of encouragement. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And um, I, I understand the encouragement we needed for these times, God did not wait until the trouble started to say what had to be said. And this morning, I will not just be shouting out all that I just think and believe, but I thought I'd spend a little time going into the spirit of prophecy and the word of God um, to bring to your heart important counsels that has the power to comfort that has the power to give guidance, that have, to have the power to get us through these difficult times victoriously. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thanks to you for sparing our lives to be part of another Sabbath day's experience. Lord, we go through weeks that are busy, full of activity. Sometimes we don't have these quiet times but today, Lord, you brought us into your sanctuary to fellowship with you, to fellowship with one another, to be taught by you. So into your hands we commit these moments. Send your Holy Spirit there, God, to speak to our hearts, comfort, strengthen, encourage. We walk away from the service today knowing that we have a friend in Jesus, a friend who loves us, a friend who cares about us, a friend who has the power to do in our lives what needs to be done today and in the days and years ahead, should time last. So guide now and bless. We ask according to your will. In Jesus' name, and let God's people say, Amen. So we're saying some words of encouragement. I have the script on the screen as my friends will walk with us through. And I want you to read with me sometimes. And as we go along and you have a response to something that's on the screen, I believe there is a place for that as well. So some words of encouragement. So the Lord in the book Ministry of Healing makes the point, huh? and this was written many years ago. She says that in 2022, we are in a world that is full of suffering. Is that true, saints? Yes. And it's not only what is happening in Ukraine. I mean, I sit, I look at the television, I see what's happening in Ukraine, and tears come to my eyes. I mean, it, it, it just reaches you to see the kind of suffering and like unnecessary suffering that mortals like ourselves have to go through. Many of all people are there too. Huh? Saints like you are there having to run for their lives. She makes a further point, huh? She tells us that difficulty, what's the word? What else? Right. Trial and sorrow await us all along the way to the heavenly home. So even though we are Christians, even though we are serving God, uh, we have got to pass through some of these dark places. Um, there is a sin that I've paid attention to many years ago says what in catch you and pass you. So sometimes you see me going through some rough spots and we see other brethren and we are pretty free and happy, but remember friend, your day is coming. 
and we don't wait until that moment comes to prepare. We must be ready for the conflict, must be ready for that troubling moment that the enemy will try to bring into our lives. But the servant Lord, though, has some very encouraging words. She reminds us, after all that I've told you, in the way that leads to the city of God, there are no difficulties which those who trust in God may not overcome. Yeah. Come on, says, get that, huh? Yes, the trouble is real, but the power and the presence of God is real. God says, I will not leave you. God says, I will not forsake you. God says, when your moment comes, I will be there. Sometimes earthly friends make these promises. Sometimes politicians make these promises. But when the moment comes, they don't have what it takes. But my God, somebody say amen. It's all powerful. And his promise, every promise that my God has given us is filled with his power. And I understand if God said it, it is done. I said if God said it, it is done. We have now to chip in there and to claim and to believe. And God is going to do what has to be done to get us through these difficult times. I love the next statement. She says, do you know what? Church, which we may not escape. Are we still together, saints? There is no danger, no trouble, no problem. Before you got there, my God was there. Amen. You know, and he has already made a way before you said the prayer, my God had the plan. I didn't hear my church. I don't know about you, but these are the moments that must cause us to rejoice. She says there's not a sorrow, not a grievance, not a human weakness for which my God has not provided a remedy. And brethren, I don't know about you, huh, but it is this kind of encouragement coming from God huh, that tells me I can get through whatever the enemy will put in my path. Uh, I don't have to fall up. I don't have to give up. I don't have to put up a white flag. Uh, I understand we've got to push this battle. We've got to fight. Somebody say amen. And we don't fight in our own might. We have to fight through the word. We have to fight through the promises. We have to fight with grace. Somebody say amen. And victory will be assured. Secret number one, servant Lord tells us if we are going to be victorious in these troubling times, we have to understand what James says to us in James chapter 4 and 7. And the counsel this morning to each of us is to do what? Submit yourselves therefore to who? To God. It is only as we submit to God, to God, uh, that we will have what it takes to resist this devil. And the Bible tells me, look, you're not going to resist him with your bank account. You're not going to resist him with your academic degrees. You're not going to resist him with that big job you have done bridge on. The only way we can deal with this old devil is with our connection with the God who have already gained the victory over him. And Jesus makes it clear that his victory is my victory. Come on, you didn't hear that. I said Jesus has made it clear that he has gained the victory for us, for me, for you. And that's why we can lay on our beds and sleep. Because we know that our lives are in God's hands. The Bible tells me once we understand how to resist this devil, he will flee. I didn't hear the church. No, he, he will flee. I said he will flee. I am talking to a lot of our members who are tormented, you know, because they believe that somebody is doing something to them, that the devil is after them, and they just don't know how to resist. They're panicking, they're in trouble, and some of them want to go to the wrong places to get help. But I'm saying to you, friend, there's no obey man can help you. You don't go to the devil to get help from the devil. When you need help over the devil, you've got to go to Jesus. Somebody say amen. The Bible says resist this fellow, 
and he will flee. But here, in the same chapter, I'm on one chapter here, um, chapter 18 of the ministry of healing, every quote I have is from there. Similar so Lord adds to that text. She says, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you, but watch this. The only way the devil will run is when you understand what you have to do to draw nigh to I hear my church. But that is true. You read the New Testament. I know that every time Jesus, a, a madman or somebody possessed with devils, came into the presence of Jesus, they were humbled. I hear the church. They start pleading mercy, begging, are we still here? Begging Jesus not to torment them. And I understand when I am in the presence of God, uh, I am in the presence of power. I said when you are in the presence of God, you have a shield. When you are in the presence of God, you have protection. When you and I are in the presence of God, we have already gained the victory. And I understand, look, in these days, man, we have got to fortify ourselves. Somebody say amen. And I don't know about any other fortification other than the one that my God can give. Jesus says, draw nigh to God. And if you are desirous this morning of taking that first step, God wants you to know that his hands already are reaching down. I didn't hear my church. I didn't hear my church. He said that my God is waiting to help. He is ready to help. His hand is already reaching down from heaven to take full control of your circumstances. So remember this now. We can stand here and preach to you. We can stand here and pray for you. But when it comes to this matter of bonding with Christ and being in his presence and staying in his presence and having a relationship with him, that is a very personal decision. Your mama can't do that for you. Your father can't do that for you. Your boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife, each of us have to come to God for ourselves. We got to open up our eyes and make that decision that we want him to abide in us so that we can abide in him. Somebody say amen. It remains with you individually and will be the Son of the Lord says, uh, a deciding factor as to whether you're going to walk in the light of the Son of Righteousness or walk in darkness. I love that. God has given me the gift of the poor of choice. I didn't hear my church. I said God has given you the gift of the poor of choice. You have your destiny in your hands. You decide this morning whether you're going to have a happy life or a miserable life. You decide as to right now whether you will be saved or lost. And you see, the reason why these things have to be emphasized, there are many some the Adventists who don't have the relationship. Hear what I tell you? You can just come and go, come and go, come and go, but I'm saying in 2022, there's need for something deeper. You know, that casual coming and going and not studying the word and not praying and not in service for God and all of that, those days are done. Come on, saints. This is revival time. Revival for the youth. Revival for the leaders. Revival for every member of the church. And I understand there's coming a time when we will be, I mean, scrambling for bare life we're not going to have this kind of opportunity. In Ukraine right now, there are many churches that are shut. Our members are scattered all over the place. Some wake up this morning not knowing how they're going to worship, except to do their own little personal thing. So I'm saying you can't now depend on anything other than the grace of God to keep us, especially in the times when... Uh, that extra help that will be near you might not be there. I'm saying to you this morning, if you are willing, 
Uh, the servant Lord, as she said it this way, she said, those who surrender their lives to God, uh, those who will surrender to his guidance, and those who will surrender to his service, will never be placed in a position for which my God uh, has not already made provision. Oh dear, come on now. I, 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 listen, I believe these are times when we should shout, huh? Uh, she says, once you surrender to God, uh, once you surrender to his guidance, you can be a member of the church who have not yet done that. When we talk about surrendering to his guidance, we are at the point where we say, that God, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It's not about how I feel anymore. It's not just about how I think. It is not just about my interpretation of truth. It's about the will of God, the power of God, the Spirit of God in me guided me. Somebody say amen. amen. And it's, when we talk about God's guidance, I mean, you become an active. There, there must be passion and interest. The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after his righteousness, for they shall be what? They shall be filled. You know, sometimes, you know, the days when you, we have to beg people to, to pray and beg people to get involved in God's service, no, those days are past. The other words, those days pass. You know, this is revival time. The church must be at its best now. And I understand the church will be at its best when individually we have come close enough to God uh, so that he can work in us and work through us to finish the work that must be finished in us and the work that must be finished through us for our neighbors and friends who need our guidance. Amen. And all I can tell you, our, our evangelism, our outreach has taken a hit in recent years. No, a bad hit. Uh, to me, it makes me concerned when, when I see that the needs out there are now greater and the church has withdrawn, are we still here? That is a problem. And I'm saying to the church, I believe your pastors and others are trying to say to us, let's get back to the job. Let's get back on the road. Let's get back to our friends. Let's get back to our neighbors. We are working with people who are hungry. My wife can tell you, people who because of circumstances, I mean, somebody looked me in the eye and said, I haven't had a good meal in a week. People who can't pay rent. People who are sick. There, there's real sickness in the land. Huh? Real, I mean. And, and the problem, I was talking to a young lady yesterday who was one of the members of our church. And she's in tears, you know. Had a boat with cancer. Um, it's coming back, she believes. And she's gone to the hospital looking for help. And she's pushed here and pushed there and doesn't have the money to pay the big bill, you know? And she walked away yesterday, she's in tears. Because she believes I'm getting sick, but I just can't find the help. I, I just want to have an appointment to know that someday I'm going to see a doctor and somebody is telling her, sorry, we can't give you a date. And the girl is crying, you know. Unfortunately, somebody was in the church. She left the church, and she said to me, I, I'm not going back because the people in the church are too wicked. <laughs> so the devil is the double winner, you know. He, he is confusing, he is dividing, he is destroying. And I'm saying to my church, man, the Lord has put us down here to make a difference, yeah. to give hope. That's what the church is about. Now, it's not about concerts and plays and all this kind of excitement, uh, if there was ever a time that the church must be in a worship, working mood, it is now. Yeah. Days for jokes are done. I understand that the Lord makes a further point, huh? She says, whatever our situation, come on, search, whatever our what? If we are doers of his word, if we are believers of his word, uh, if we are living in obedience to his word, she says we have a guide to direct our way. Somebody say amen. amen. Whatever our perplexity, we have a sure 
Counselor, whatever our sorrow, whatever our bereavement, our loneliness, thank God we have a sympathizing friend. I said we have a sympathizing friend. Maybe the church will show how to for that, huh? I said we have a sympathizing friend. When the body is in here, you might, God is listening to you. And God doesn't only listen with empty talk. Uh, my God listens with a heart of compassion. My God listens with understanding. Uh, my God listens with power. Are uh, we still here? So after the listening, uh, listen, even before he hears you, my God start working. I understand the point made by John in John 15. God said, look, if you abide in and my words abide in, you shall do what? Ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Somebody say amen. I know, but listen to you. I want to, do you believe that? God says once there's this relationship between you and him, huh? you have power. When God says, I will answer you, that ain't no empty talk. I said, that ain't no some strange promise. That is what my God will do. He might not answer you according to what you want, but he can ask, answer you according to what you need. Because he told me long ago that all of your needs shall be satisfied. And when God begins to talk to us, sometimes we misunderstand, but he takes them and clarifies. So that when it's time to act, the right actions are taken. Some last year I was not well. First time in my 70 years of life that I became ill. And you know, I'm working with doctors who are giving me some guidance. But after a while, you know, I'm confused. I'm not sure, you know, and um, my doctor is making decisions that not comforting to me. He promised to do some things and proceeds I get there, he forgets. And then he did tell me that he's going to perform a surgical procedure he thinks will solve my problem. And I expected that this is what he was going to do. Like two weeks before the surgery, he called me and told me that there's another doctor coming from overseas to do the surgery. And that confused me even a little more. Somebody I don't know, somebody I can't trust. And I began to do my little checks. Told me the doctor was coming from way in the Virgin Islands. I called the friend, who is this doctor? My daughters go online to see, you know, a profile of this doctor, all of that. As I got to the north, um, to the US Virgin Islands, um, I ended up going right to our unit evangelist. And he said to me, listen, this doctor performed surgery on me and he messed me up. When he was finished, I was worse than when he began. And you know, that was the Friday because the doctor is coming the Monday and he wants to operate the Tuesday <laughs> without having any serious consultation. I had to get on my knees. I, I, I mean, started to pray to God. Huh? And you know, in my prayer, I got up Sabbath morning and all I can hear God say to me, I am your shield. Over and over and over again, everywhere I turn, I am your shield. And I told my wife, and you know, God told me he's my shield. And if God is saying to me that he's my shield, it means it's not about that do doctor, his weaknesses, failures. God will do my surgery through him. But that was my interpretation on Sabbath. And then on Sunday, I got another call from U.S. Virgin Islands telling me it's not just our evangelists, but this guy has messed up a whole lot of other men. Well, I understood what God was trying to tell me. I understood he was telling me that he was going to shield me from this man. <laughs> you know? So you have to don't rush, take time. God is going to explain. And you know, immediately I, I stopped. I, I called my, my urologist. urologist. I told him, hey, listen, I don't like what I'm hearing. It's not sounding good. I can't take this surgery, and it was a good thing I didn't. That same day, I met 
When I told my wife I was going to go for, she told me, don't. <laughs> she didn't agree. Listen to your wife. Huh? She told me that was a bad decision, and I get to know it was because I did not fully understand at first what God was saying. And the same moment, my, my daughter called me from Nebraska and told me there's a urology clinic five minutes from where I live, and immediately she made some connection, and doctors there were planning for my surgery. Guiding, and they were asking for documents, and before I got there, they had it all sorted out and deciding what they will do. And um, I did make that decision. I understood God was talking, and I'm off to the States. I, 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 I didn't have the resources. You're going to the States, call for money, huh? For surgery. But once God says, move, move, yeah. I did my church. Yeah. I didn't have it, but I understood. God says, go, you go. Make provision. We start talking about going, and I saw God working. I mean, working miraculously to make sure I got there. When I got there, and the doctor took me into his office and put open up his big screen and showed me what was going on in my body, I understood if I had taken that surgery, I would have just made a mess of my life. He was going to do something that should not have been done. And I would have been back in surgery because the major issue he did not see, even though they did all those scans. Says, are we still here? You've got to trust God, trust God, trust God, trust God, trust God, and not man. And you know, that surgery was done, and a few things happened, and my hospital bill went over $100,000. And poor Beckett, you know, I don't have the zeros to add behind one. But thank God, I have a heavenly father who loves and who cares and who is powerful. And that hospital gave to me when it was finished 75% discount on my bill. Amen. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Huh? I never knew that I could get those kind of gifts. God says, call upon me, I will answer you, and I'm going to show you some great and mighty things you have never yet seen. A friend called me and told me somebody had prayed for when they were sick. Uh, and we're here, and a brother came to me, he told me, Pastor, I hear you have to go for a surgical procedure. And he told me, listen, man, I want to help you. He told me, call the number. Are we still here? Yeah. I told I, I don't call numbers, you know. And he told me, would $4,000 help you? Yeah. In the morning, I, 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 told, I told any gift is a gift. And I remember the morning I was traveling, that brother came uh, and gave me an open U.S. tech sign uh, and told me, I believe you're going to run into trouble. If you need help, here is the check. I didn't cash it. I didn't trouble it. Because God had other ways to provide. Somebody saved me. The point I'm trying to make this morning huh, is that we serve a big God. And I, I just want to encourage you because I understand there's a lot going on. Huh? Whatever our situation in the on that side, it says if, you, if we are doers of his word, we have a guide to direct our way. Whatever our perplexity, we have this counselor, and we've gone through all of that. I understand, uh, even when we make the wrong decisions, did you get that? It says, if in our ignorance we make mistakes, our Savior does not do what? We need never feel that we are Angels are our, the comforter that Christ promised to send his name uh, abides with us. Somebody say amen. And I understand, man, is when we are in him and in the spirit that the, God tells us that the fruit of the spirit will be manifest in our lives. In our lives, there's going to be love. Are we still here? And joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith, meekness and temperance. It is these kind of, kind of qualities that will get us through this life. And I also understand, several Lord commenting on this kind of experience, she says, courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love, all these wonderful gifts that the Spirit of God makes a reality in our lives, she says promote two things. Promote, first of all, health, but also promote what else? Love prolong life. I love this next quote, um, point. It says, a contented mind 
What kind of a spirit? A cheerful spirit is what? Health to the body and strength to the... A merry heart doeth good like a what? In other words, that when we're not broken down and complaining and full of misery, brother, you are into a good life. I did that in my church. On the other hand, the servant Lord makes the point that a broken spirit does what? Dries up the bones, saps your life energy, takes away your love and happiness, and causes life to become really hard. And that's why the Bible tells us this, man, in Romans 12 and 2, we need to make sure that we give God a chance to work with these minds of ours. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be what? By the what? We knew it of our minds that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I understand the God we serve. He knows man's mind. Somebody say amen. He knows what our minds need. Come on, tents. God alone is the one who can do what? Talk with me now. God is the only one who can heal. I was at a funeral service sometime. A brother who died from prostate cancer. Man, there was this sister there, and she was just passionate, man. If this guy had only eaten the tomatoes, only eat the tomatoes, only eat the tomatoes, he would never die. Yes, I'm friends, tomatoes don't heal. Bush tea don't heal. It is Jesus who heals. God has to work through the tomato juice. God has to work through the bush tea. God has to work through the surgery. If God doesn't work through these things, we will not be here. But see, when we begin to put our load, our, our full weight in these things, we get disappointed. Because what he, brother, what's mine? No, he's me. We are here, my church. Brother, the worst medicine might be my poison. Are uh, we still here, saints? So, you know, we need God. We, we need his direction. We need his guidance. We need his protection. And that's why I'm saying to you, in 2022, man, if you were just somebody who come by here, you have to get serious about your religion. Serious about your Christian life. Huh? God said, because I live in John 14, 19, huh? he said that you shall live. I live in my church. And he has to give us life and protect and preserve that life. The power of the will under God's guidance is not, the servant Lord tells us, value as it should be. Let the will be kept awake and rightly directed and it will impart energy to the whole being. Come on, church. And it will be a wonderful aid in the maintenance of what? Health and success. She says further, the will is also a power in dealing with disease. I hear my church. The will on the divine guidance is your first pill. It's your first medicine. Somebody say amen. You will be as sick as you feel. I hear my church. You will be healed as fast as as you can believe the power of God and the grace of God will do it. So we understand that God wants this mind of ours to be locked in with his. And she says, once the mind, that will that God has given to us, is exercised in the right direction, it will control the imagination, somebody say amen, and be a potent means of doing a number of things, of resisting and doing what else? Overcoming disease of both mind and body. By such employment of the mind and the free use of air and sunlight, many a battle life might recover health and strength. Ah, abiding peace, true rest in the spirit, has but one source. And the servant all reminds us that source is found in none other than Christ Jesus himself. He was the one who said, come on to me, all you that what? Yeah. And are heavy laden, and I will do what? Yeah. And John 14, 27, he says, my peace I do what? My peace I give unto you. He said, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let my church say amen. Yeah. Some Lord tells that this peace is not something he gives apart from himself. It is in Christ that we can receive this peace 
And we only receive his peace when we receive him. I did it in my church. If you want to have this quiet life, this life that is full of hope and confidence, in 2022, you have to be take with God. I did it in my church. You know, you can't use God as a spare tire. Huh? Only come in when you want help. We have to abide, abide, abide. Get up in the morning, man, and lock in with him. Uh, go to bed at night, locking in with him. Uh, and my God stays with you through take and sin. He said, I am the, come on now, he said, I'm the what? I am the way, what else? I'm the truth, what else? And he says, no man will reach the Father but by me. Christ, the same Lord reminds us, is the wellspring of life. That which many need is to have a what? Talk with me, talk with me, church. To have a what? A clear knowledge of him. They need to be patiently and kindly, yet earnestly taught how the whole being may be thrown open to the healing agencies of heaven. When the sunlight of God's love illuminates the darkened chambers of our souls, restless weariness and dissatisfaction will cease. Somebody say amen. And satisfying joys will give vigor to the mind, health and energy to the body. I love the next quote. She says, for every trial, my God has done what? Talk with me now. My God has done what? When Israel was in the desert, um, when they had to deal with the bitter waters of Marah, Moses cried unto the Lord. The Lord did not provide some new remedy. He called attention to that which was already at hand. There was a shrub out there, somebody say amen, that my God had created long before this trouble. A shrub which he had created was to be cast into the fountain to make the water pure and sweet. When this was done, the people drank that water that was bitter, and thank God they were refreshed. In every trial, if we will seek God, uh, my God will give us, come on church, my God will give us, I believe that with all my heart. That is true. And I believe before this year ends, before this week ends, somebody can have to cash in. I understand in the same chapter, she says, uh, we are not to let the future with its hard problems, with its unsatisfying prospects, make our hearts faint. Are we still there, saints? She said, our knees must not tremble. Our hands must never hang down. God's counsel to us is very simple. He says in Isaiah 27 and 5, let him take hold of my what? Talk with me, church. Let him take hold of mine that he may make peace with and he shall make peace with me. Somebody say amen. So the help is out there. Before you needed it, it was ready for you. And because God is so present and so powerful and loves us the way he loves us, she said not one of us here this morning need to abandon ourselves to discouragement and despair. Wait, sir, you didn't hear that, did you? Church, church, did you get that? We're coming home. She says, nobody in this audience, whether you be young, 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 middle-aged, or senior citizen, need not abandon ourselves to, to what? To discouragement or to... She says, in times of difficulty, we must not faint. But instead of fainting, we must pray. Satan may come to you with the cruel suggestion. Yours is a, what kind of case? You are irredeemable. But come on, let's read this together. It says there's what? Come on, now read this, man. There's what? Hope for you in God does not bid us overcome in our own. He asks us to do what? Come close to his side. Whatever difficulties we labor under, which weigh down soul and body, my God right now wants to set some child free. Free from disease. 
free from financial troubles, free from marital problems, free from disobedient trouble, children's woes. Are we still here? My God has the power, but my God also has the desire to help. And if we are not helped, brethren, it's because we refuse to cash in the way he expects us to. The Bible tells me the Son shall make you free. Thank God you shall be free indeed. He took humanity upon himself. He who took all humanity knows how to sympathize with his suffering children. And not only does Christ know every soul and the peculiar needs and trials that each of us are going through this morning, but he knows all the circumstances that wears down perplex us one by one. His hand is outstretched, as I told you when I begin, in pity and tenderness to every suffering child. Those who suffer most, she says, has more, have most of his sympathy and pity. For we have not this morning a high priest, somebody say amen, which cannot be touched with all what? But was in how many points? All points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He is touched with the field of our infirmities, and he desires this morning to lay all perplexity and troubles at his feet, and he wants us to leave them there. And my church. I want you to go back home this morning with peace. Somebody say amen. I want you to go back home this morning with hope. I don't know what you're going through. Sometimes there's sickness, man, and it's got you burdened. But that case of illness, we have to put in God's hands. That money problem, God's hands. That rent problem, God's hands. But since are we still here? Whatever it is, whatever it is, that fear in God's hands. My God wants his people to be free from these burdens. He said that his, his yoke is easy and his burden, he takes our troubles and he gives us his blessing. When temptation assails you, friend, when care, perplexity, and darkness seems to surround your soul, look to the place where you last saw the light. Rest in Christ's Love and under his projecting clear care. When sin struggles for the mastery of your heart, when guilt oppresses the soul and burdens the conscience, when unbelief clouds the mind, remember that Christ's grace, come on now, Christ's grace is what? To subdue sin and to banish the darkness. I end with these promises. Bible tells me, man, in Psalms 34 and 22, that the Lord does what? Redeem of the soul of his servants. And none of them that do what? Trust in him shall be desolate. Isaiah 49, Zion, Zion God's people, huh? says this amount, we have been forsaken. Jehovah has forsaken me, Zion says. And the Lord has forgotten me. Have you ever felt like that? I spoke to, I spoke to one of our members yesterday who told me just those words. Just yesterday, we were at the doctor, and she was there. She told me that when I started talking to her about getting back getting to God, she told me that she don't believe in, in this God thing so much because he has not been answering her prayers. See what I mean? That's the devil. He tricks us. Here's the, only, here, here's the member of my church who needs God, and she's telling to me she does not trust him anymore because she was talking and he wasn't answering. She needs help. But, you know, the question was asked, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of, his, of her womb? Yeah, the Bible says these may what? Come on, these may what? Yet will not I forget thee. God says, behold, I've done what? Graven thee upon the palm of my hand. That is how precious you are to God today. And that's why this morning he says to the church, let's read together. He says, do what? Fear thou 
not. Come on, say, listen, go say this together now. What's the word? Fear thou not, for I am. Be not this, for I am still thy God. God says, I will do what? Strengthen thee. God says, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I don't know about you, saints, but look, it pays to be a Christian, you hear? It just makes sense. In these dark times, he says in Isaiah 4, 6, 3, listen to me, all Israel who are left, all of us who are here this morning, God says, I have done what? I created you, and I care for you since you were conceived. Since, are we still together? But he didn't stop there. He went on to make the further point. God says, I will be your what? Through all of your lifetime. Even when you hear, get white. Mine just getting white. My wife already whitening up full time. But I know that God still loves her. God doesn't change his mind with gray hair. Somebody say amen. You know, sometimes you've got children who, when you get old, or people, your boss, whoever, once you get old, they finish with you. But my God never finished with you. Whether you are alive, whether you are dead, whether you are sick, whether you are well, my God will always be there. Uh, he said, I made you. And he said, I will do what? Care for you. I will carry you along, and I will always be your savior. And because of this, now we need to start giving God some praise. Are they here my church? Uh, you know, I said, my Lord, this is time to be rejoiced. Some people said this is trouble. And we need to be broken. And No. When we see what God has done for us, what my God is doing for us, this is a time when there need to be a lot of praises in our hearts, in our homes, in our church. She says nothing ten more to promote health of body and of soul than the, the spirit of Gratitude and what else? It is a positive duty to do what? Resist melancholy, discontent, thoughts, discontented thoughts and what else? And feelings. As much a duty as it is to do what? To pray. If we are heaven born, how can we go as a band of mourners groaning and complaining all along the way to the Father's house? Let us Brethren, this morning, educate our hearts and our lips. Come on now, to do what? To speak the what? The praise of God for his matchless love. Let us do what else? Educate our souls to be hopeful and to abide, come on, says, in the light that's shining from Calvary's cross. Never should we forget that we are children of the heavenly king. We are there in my church. I said we are children of the heavenly king. We are sons and daughters of the Lord of hosts. It is our privilege to maintain a calm repose in God. Forgetting our difficulties and our troubles this morning, let us praise God for an opportunity to live for the glory of his name. Amen. Let the fresh blessings of each new day awaken praise in our hearts for these tokens of his love and care. When you open your eyes tomorrow morning, when you wake up tomorrow morning, friends, don't get up complaining about the economy. Are we still here? Don't get up talking politics. She says, wake up tomorrow morning, doing what? Thank God when you get up that he has what? Kept you through the night. Thank him for his peace in your heart, morning, noon, and night. Let gratitude as a sweet perfume ascend to heaven. Let praise and thanksgiving, man, be expressed in song. When tempted, instead of giving utterance to our feelings, let us by faith lift up a song of thanksgiving. One, like I think we will end to sing this message this morning. Someone already says, man, we praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love. Somebody say amen. For Jesus who died and is now gone to Come on, are you going to sing this with us?
Come on, let's sing the song. As our song leaders come and help us with it. We praise your God. It's on the screen. Um, hallelujah, then the glory. No, it's on the screen. Yes, yes, we're going to sing it. Everybody wrote the song. Let's the song. As we come to our closing moments. I think, friends, that God wants his people in these difficult times huh, to understand that, yes, the world is full of darkness, but heaven is filled with light. I didn't hear my church. And if there was ever a time, we really need to make sure that we keep our relationship with God, it is now. It is today. It is every Sabbath, but not only on Sabbaths. All during the week, wherever we are, whatever comes our way, remember, we have a friend who... Is it the hymn? It's not in him. Oh, it's not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're going. Let me start. Come on, let's sing the song. The first verse one. We praise Thee, O oh God. Bible time. Praise the Lord. Amen. We want to thank God for our Pastor Bethel and the message that he has given us today. Amen. 
I don't know about you, but I was truly inspired. And we thank God for that. So we are going to continue our praise and thanksgiving by singing our closing song, which is number 512, 512. as we prepare for the benediction. Um, just let me apologize for even offering you another announcement. After such a sermon, I would not want to give another announcement, but um, it brought to my attention that perhaps some of the information we've been getting as regards Sister Alder's um, home going service, that might need some refinement. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that you listen out. It's the 21st. I've been give, we let me know say, that the 21st date remains. So please continue to listen out for that announcement. Sister Alders feel it should be on the radio. On the radio, yes. So please remember that. But just let me thank the elder again. Praise the Lord for the message. Amen. Please bow your heads for closing prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you shield us. Shield us from the amnesia that sometimes besets us when we leave those doors and help us to keep the word that we have heard today in our hearts throughout this week. Help us to hold on to your strength and lay all of our burdens at your feet. And Lord, my prayer for all of those that are in the hearing of my voice is that the Lord may bless you and keep you, that he will cause his face to shine upon you, that may the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. let it be a marching song number 612 onward christian soldiers 612 that's a parting song <laughs> 